The US government has all sorts of secrets, from the absurd to the insane, the hilarious to the horrific. Few governments are as willing to declassify their secrets, especially if it harms their image, which gives us disturbing insight into what the most powerful nation on earth has gotten up to behind everyone's backs. Today, we crack open the files to reveal more of America's most disturbing government secrets. If you like this content, check out our other videos on similar topics. It's common knowledge that the US meddled in the affairs of South America throughout the Cold War. A perfect example of this is Chile. The US was concerned about the rise of socialism and communist sympathies in Chile throughout the 1960s, focused mostly around the figure of Salvador Allende. The US spent millions bolstering Allende's opponents in the 1964 election, which Allende narrowly lost. With the 1970 election fast approaching, President Richard Nixon and his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger feared that Allende would finally take power. The US's fears were realized by Allende's victory in September 1970. Soon after, Nixon authorized Project Fubelt in late 1970, with a budget of $10 million to foment a coup against Allende. It is the only verified record of a US president authorizing the overthrow of a democratically elected leader. The US reached out to the only group in Chile with the power and potential to overthrow Allende, the military. They found plenty of allies, but also an obstacle. The Commander-in-Chief General René Schneider. Schneider was an upstanding constitutionalist who would never support a coup, so the CIA decided to get rid of him. The CIA funded a small group of men to kidnap Schneider and allow one of their allies to take over the military. They would blame Allende for the kidnapping, oust him in a coup and place a new person into power. The attack took place on October 22, 1970, and it was a disaster. The attackers ambushed Schneider's vehicle on the streets of Santiago, but Schneider fought back. In the ensuing gunfight, Schneider was hit multiple times. The attackers were forced to flee while Schneider died of his injuries a few days later. Schneider's death infuriated Chile. Allende enjoyed a surge of support from a population who saw the attack on Schneider as an attack on their democracy. Although the US hid its involvement, the hope for a coup disappeared. The US spent the rest of Allende's presidency funding opposition groups and trying to isolate Chile diplomatically. Eventually, in 1973, another coup was attempted. This time, the US appears not to have been involved, and unlike the 1970 attempt, this one succeeded. Allende was deposed and committed suicide, with a new regime led by Augusto Pinochet rising in his place. Pinochet proved to be one of the most divisive and debated figures of 20th century South American history, but he is a story for another time. Documents reveal that the CIA was aware of the coup beforehand, but was unlikely to have been involved. Allies of Pinochet had approached the CIA for aid, but the CIA believed that it was, quote, strictly an internal Chilean matter. However, it was obvious that the US would welcome a coup, and the new regime needn't fear US condemnation. Investigations by the Senate's 1975 Church Commission and a 1991 Chilean committee both concluded that the CIA had no demonstrable involvement. Chile is a representative example of the US's meddling in Southern and Central American politics through the 20th century. It showed that the nation which prided itself on being the arsenal of democracy against the Nazis was happy to subvert democracy in its own ideological war. Using documents declassified in 1998, General Schneider's family tried to file a lawsuit against Henry Kissinger in 2001 for his role in Schneider's death, but the case was quickly dismissed. Otherwise, no one faced any repercussions for the USA's actions in Chile. 
The US government's dubious tolerance of democracy and political opposition wasn't just for foreign policy. The US government has exerted massive amounts of time and effort on those it deems domestic threats. And few projects were more infamous for this than COINTELPRO. This was an FBI campaign to target a range of domestic political groups, including the Communist Party, feminist movements, anti-Vietnam war protesters, American Indian groups, the Ku Klux Klan, and most famously, the Civil Rights Movement. It lasted for over 15 years, until it was exposed by an activist group using stolen documents in 1971. Their MO was to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, and otherwise neutralize key figures in the target movements. The vast majority of COINTELPRO targets were left-wing political groups. With the Cold War raging, the US feared that any group could be infiltrated by communists. They also feared the social unrest that the civil rights movement specifically might bring. Some of these targets were justified. For example, in 1964, the FBI successfully identified 21 KKK members who had murdered three civil rights activists in a case known as the Mississippi Burnings. COINTELPRO also included the FBI's efforts to deal with the slate of violence from far-left groups in the 1960s and 1970s, which included thousands of bomb attacks, shootings, and other episodes that left many people dead. However, much of the work was dishonest and illegal. One common target of this were the Black Panthers. It is true that the Black Panthers were an armed separatist group linked to the killings of many police officers and civilians. But the FBI employed extreme and illegal methods against it, even when they knew their targets were innocent. One of the most famous cases was the killing of Fred Hampton in 1969. Following a shootout between Chicago police and Black Panther members in November 1969, the FBI decided to decapitate the city's Black Panther leadership. Hampton was a leading figure in Chicago's Panther scene, but wasn't in state at the time of the shooting, and no evidence has ever emerged suggesting his involvement, but that was enough for the FBI. In the early hours of December 4th, 1969, an FBI informant in Hampton's inner circle secretly drugged Hampton in his apartment. Shortly after, a 14-man police team raided them. They killed one panther who had been sitting in the apartment before moving to Hampton's bedroom. They found Hampton lying in bed next to his heavily pregnant wife, barely conscious from the drugs the informant had fed him. When the officers identified him, they opened fire. Hampton was unarmed and barely able to move, let alone pose a threat to the officers. It was nothing more than an execution. Another unjust target among the Panthers was Geronimo Pratt. After serving two tours in Vietnam, Pratt had settled down in Los Angeles and joined the Panthers, where he quickly rose up the ranks. Declassified FBI memos show that Pratt had attracted their attention by early 1970. Soon after, he was arrested and charged with the 1968 murder of an elementary school teacher. Pratt insisted that he was innocent and had been away at a Panther meeting in Oakland at the time, but he ended up being convicted and sentenced to 27 years in prison anyway. But in 1997, it was revealed that the FBI had lied. Not only was one of the key witnesses against Pratt an undisclosed FBI informant, but the FBI had concealed evidence that proved Pratt's alibi. The FBI had hidden wiretap recordings of the Oakland meeting that proved Pratt was 400 miles away on the night of the murder. Pratt was finally released in July 1997, having served 25 years of his 27-year sentence for a crime the FBI knew he never committed. But no target within the civil rights movement was so significant as Martin Luther King himself. They'd first identified King during the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott, and there was a long-standing suspicion that he was being influenced by communists. As King's profile grew, Attorney General Robert Kennedy authorized the FBI to wiretap King's home and offices. 
The contents of these tapes are understood to have contained incriminating information, including details of King's extramarital affairs. However, these tapes remain classified until at least 2027. In 1964, the FBI sent an now infamous letter to King, where it denounced him as a fraud, hinted at its knowledge of King's affairs, and seemingly pressured him to commit suicide. The letter called King a complete fraud and an evil, abnormal beast. It told him that there is only one thing left for you to do, believed by most to be a call for him to commit suicide or have all his secrets exposed. Of course, King didn't follow its advice, and the FBI never came through with its threat, but today, the letter is a startling reminder of the FBI's vicious targeting of civil rights leaders. To this day, many groups, especially those on the political left and those advocating for black rights, distrust the government and constantly worry that they will be targeted like so many before them. It's not just the political left that fears persecution. In recent years, the political right has become increasingly opposed to the FBI, CIA, and other intelligence agencies, seen most clearly in the rhetoric of Donald Trump. There is a pervasive fear among the right of so-called feds tricking, entrapping, and persecuting them for political reasons. Few cases have fueled that paranoia quite like that of the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot. In October 2020, the US was horrified to learn that the FBI had stopped a plot by right-wing extremists to kidnap the Democratic governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. It should have been an open and shut case. The prosecution described how the 14 men charged had formed a plan, bought weapons and explosives, and acquired military training in preparation to take Governor Whitmer hostage in an act of blatant domestic terrorism. However, things became murky when the FBI's heavy involvement in the group was revealed. Documents and testimonies from the trials show that the FBI had at least 12 informants or undercover agents working with the conspirators. The defendants insisted that these informants and agents had been behind the whole thing. They argued that the defendants had only been talking about their distaste for the governor when the FBI first identified them. They alleged that it was the FBI informants who had hatched the plot and encouraged it in order to entrap the men and gain credit for stopping a supposed terrorist group. This started to sound believable when the group's leader, Dan Chappell, was revealed to be an FBI informant. It was Chappell who had organized and provided the military training that the prosecution used as proof of the group's intent. Chappell had also provided funds to buy weapons, ammunition, and explosives via a credit card paid for by the FBI. Chappell had been involved in every step of the plan and had worked closely with conspirator Adam Fox, who the FBI described as the mastermind of the whole conspiracy. Another informant had organized and paid for the meetings where the plot was first created, once again using FBI funds. Yet another female FBI informant had allegedly engaged in inappropriate conduct with certain group members, and it emerged that FBI informants had also supplied illegal drugs to group members and recorded them while they were high. The defendants claimed they were tricked into saying outrageous things while intoxicated so that the FBI could get incriminating information on tape. On at least two occasions, the FBI informants also stepped in to prevent the group expelling radical members that might have stopped the plot before it began. When other members of the group expressed concern about Adam Fox's extremism, FBI informant Chappell stepped in and persuaded the group to keep him around, actively defending him and pushing the group to listen to Fox in meetings. Later, the group tried to distance themselves from another member, Barry Croft Jr., who they believed had become too extreme. But once again, FBI informants persuaded them to keep Croft around. In one text message, an informant defended Croft, saying that the group needed, quote, the good ideas Croft brought. 
Of the 14 men brought to trial, six have been found guilty, including Croft and Fox. Two not guilty, and the rest still await their day in court. A plot to kidnap an elected governor is evil. The question is, would that evil have ever been considered without the FBI's involvement? The leader of the group was an FBI informant. The FBI paid for their equipment, the FBI informants organized and paid for its meetings, and when the group tried to expel the masterminds of the plot, the FBI informants stopped them. Even BuzzFeed, an outlet on the opposite end of the political spectrum to the conspirators, noted that the FBI, quote, had a hand in nearly every aspect of the alleged plot, and questioned whether there would have even been a conspiracy without them. The Whitmer kidnapping case only helped to divide an already fractured country around the time of the 2020 election. It gave fuel to the right's belief that the US government is using deceptive and dishonest tactics to demonize them, just as it has done to the political left for decades. But that's enough seriousness and politics for now. No matter what side of the political divide you fall, Everyone loves a good ghost story, including the US government. The Vietnam War was full of weird and disturbing things, but one of the weirdest has to be Operation Wandering Soul. Many Vietnamese people had a strong belief in the existence of ghosts and spirits. If someone was not given a proper burial, it was widely believed that their ghost would be forced to wander the earth forever. As you can imagine, the war left countless people without a proper burial. Well, the US decided to take advantage of these beliefs. They recorded tapes full of eerie noises and voices, supposedly from the souls of dead Vietnamese people. The Americans then mounted speakers on helicopters or boats, or infiltrated enemy lines and rigged the speakers in the jungle, to blast these terrifying tapes across the jungle. Here's a little taste of them. As scary as they were, there's mixed reports of the success of these tapes. Most of the time, it seems the Viet Cong knew what was happening and would shoot in the direction of the sound. This strange project was discontinued sometime in the early 1970s. Things were even weirder in the Philippines. In the 1950s, US psychological warfare experts were brought in to help the Filipino government deal with communist guerrillas. The guerrillas were mostly rural farmers, so the US reasoned that they probably had all the superstitions and beliefs that rural farmers were known for. This gave them an idea. The most terrifying creature in Filipino folklore is the Aswang a vampire-like monster that drains the blood from its victims. According to the biography of the American general in charge of the Philippines' operations, the Americans put the story to good use. In one instance, the Americans spread rumors that an Aswang was lurking near a village, where the guerrillas were hiding. After giving the rumors time to spread, the Americans lay in ambush for a guerrilla patrol in the middle of the night. The Americans silently snatched the last man in the patrol without alerting his comrades, killed him, and then put puncture wounds in his neck to look like an Aswang attack. They drained as much blood as they could before leaving the body to be found by his comrades. Amazingly, this worked. When the patrol found the body the next morning, they were terrified, and the entire guerrilla force retreated from the village. Ridiculous ideas of using local beliefs in psychological warfare didn't disappear with the Cold War either. During the Gulf War, the US possessed directed audio technology and the ability to create rudimentary holograms. According to sources seen by the Washington Post, the Air Force discussed using this technology to project a giant fireball above Baghdad and then have the voice of Allah command the Iraqis to overthrow Saddam's government. Tragically, this amazing plan was never attempted. We can only imagine what it would have looked like. 
If you want to keep learning about secrets like this, subscribe so that you can be kept up to date on our new videos, and leave a like to show you enjoy this kind of content. And before you go, remember, the next time God appears in a blazing fireball to tell you to overthrow your government, relax, because it's probably just the US government screwing around again.